like to invite you all for coming out. Thank you for being here in support of Breakthrough Energy and new technologies that will advance us in energy production and healing and all of these different topics. Thank you for being here. Yes, thank you very much for coming. So this is Vortex Based Technologies. This is what we're going to be talking about today. And um, if we, do we have a, let's see if this works. Oh, my, again, my name is Daniel Nunez. And I'm Erica Nunez. <laughs> okay. So basically, we're going to explain from the beginning how everything started with us. Um, we're independent researchers, but approximately five years ago, we were very superficial uh, bartender, model, actor, and um, we had no idea about anything about sustainable energies or anything about self-healing, very conditioned, basically. Okay. So we started a nightlight project because I was unable to sleep in the dark, so my husband did a lot of research, as well as I. But in the beginning, it was more finding a way that we can make a nightlight that we don't have to pay. Con Edison in New York is Con Edison, that we wouldn't have to pay so much money for having the nightlight on all night. So after looking into different um, current alternative energy options, we realized that the solutions today are either too ex expensive or susceptible to failure um, due to the changing weather conditions. This launched us into a quest for a different type of energy amplification. We began analyzing previous exotic technologies which claim to operate using zero point energy or the energy of the universe. After countless hours of researching permanent magnet motors, solid state generators, and many other elaborate technologies, we narrowed down our interest to one of the few areas of research that aim to tackle the fundamental law in our current energy distribution designs of today, vortex-based mathematics. Today, our focus is geared, is geared towards applying these general principles in order to create new sustainable alternatives for a wide range of sectors that are in need of new solutions. Thank you for that, Mrs. Nunez. <laughs> so this is the mathematical theory behind it all. We're very blessed to have Mr. Randy Powell here in support of Vortex-Based Math. He will be talking later on this, uh, this afternoon. So the Vortex-Based Math principle. Vortex-Based Math states that all, circulate, all circulating energy flows in natural predetermined pathways of symmetry and these pathways, if utilized correctly, can optimize efficiency by creating the path of least resistance for the energy flow. And you see Marco Rodin here, Mr. Randy Powell on the right. And this is the premise of vortex-based mathematics. This is like looking at our energy with a different perspective altogether, one that says that we're not really following the path of least resistance right now. And what if we actually start following that path? What happens? So that was primarily the focus of where we wanted to gear towards because, again, solar panels, they don't work during the, the nighttime. Wind turbines won't work when the wind is not present. So the only thing that we saw as a viable solution was to tackle the fundamental. So that's vortex-based math. Some of the supporting avenues of research that I'm sure many of you are familiar, familiar with are, again, vortex math. Dan Winters, Implosion Physics. So Dan Winters is talking about fractal geometry and how fractals basically create the three-dimensional reality that we exist in. So in the Sim Harriman's Grand Unified Field Theory, many of you are familiar with that, it talks about the torus, again, as, as the most inclusive energy source altogether. And if we were to engineer ourselves into that type of reality, we would be having a much more sustainable today. So torsion physics, that's also the same, the same avenue. Cymatics, we mentioned that because cymatics talks about the effect of sound on matter. And we found that to be a crucial element in these vortex coils. And I um, wanted to set things up. We didn't really have so much time for, uh, for preparations here. But what happens with these coils, and we will discuss that a little bit later in the slide, is that these coils, when you put a precise sound frequency into these devices, you can actually get out more energy from the coil than what's put into them. And that's pretty much something that science says is not really supposed to happen right now. But yet we're able to do that on, on a uh, very uh, stable uh, basis. 
So Thomas Bearden, scalar wave technologies, we're talking about two directional energy waves. What you see here is two directional energy waves. We have counterclockwise rotation, clockwise ro rotation, and it really doesn't matter which comes first. You see clockwise is above the counterclockwise. It doesn't matter if you interchange the two. So that's scalar wave energy, using the fundamental of two energy waves and combining the two. Lee Burton's low shoe matrix is very similar to Vortex math, same understanding of these certain pathways of symmetry. Walter Russell, many of you are familiar with, and of course, fractal geometry again. So these are some of the people that we mentioned there. And we see the phi, phi spiral. We see um, you know, just these fundamentals. We see galaxies. They look like two toroidal energies, one atop the other, creating an accretion disk where we live. <laughs> so that's Nassim Haram in there, Dan Winters. These are some of our early replications of the rodent coil, which was the first physical interpretation of BBM into coil form. It was developed by a seasoned engineer named Russell P. Blake and was later adopted by Jamie Berturf. These coils have been applied as therapy devices for the body, sensitive antenna systems, high-speed motor generators, and many other applications. So that's this one right here. This was one of our flattened out rodent coil designs. And we took that same geometry as 12 o'clock, 5 o'clock pattern, and we just flattened it out and created a type of structure so that we can maintain the geometry. So that's that one. This is the Abha Taurus. Randy Powell's interpretation of vortex-based mathematics. It was the first visual that introduced us to his advanced work over two years ago and sparked a different perspective within our minds. Around the same time, we encountered this crop circle image, which served as an exciting confirmation to continue researching along this path. So this is very interesting. We, we get into these geometries. Anyone who's ever dove into sacred geometry or anything along that path will attest to the fact that you come up with these things like crop circles and it's very powerful to say that nobody knows where they come from. They just happen to pop into these wheat fields or you know, just show up out of nowhere. And then one of the byproducts is a high concentration of magnetic energy right in the center of these crop circles where people can go lay down and experience healing. So that's a big deal. And it's a little bit more along the, the fringe path with that I guess we're all very um, into Which that. Which <laughs> makes very much sense with our coils because at the center of our coil is where the most uh, magnetic field comes out of from the center of our coils. And we'll definitely touch on that in a moment as well. So this was the first Abha coil that we see here. It's created by an engineer named Jack Scholes. With it, he demonstrated prolonged resonance. So what does that mean? Well, Jack Scholes had a different type of rendering of a vortex coil, Abha coil, and he turns it on and he has a magnet just like this one spinning in the center or above a, a glass plate. So you see there is a glass bowl. So then the gentleman walks away 15 feet or more and that, that magnet is still spinning in resonance with that coil. So how does something like that happen? How is it able to quantum lock so that this magnet can sustain that type of rotation. It's something never before seen by any other technology. So we just found that to be very, very important. And again, that's the, the first Abha coil that we made. So as you can see there, we basically took this out of a plexiglass uh, plate and we carved out by hand every one of the notches for the wires to lay in. After that, we figure how are we gonna keep the wires in place? We used clay for that. Not the most practical thing to, to use to create your structures, but it worked. And with it, we demonstrated energy reduction purposes, so feeding energy through it so that you can conserve energy, high-speed magnet motors, and other applications. The unification coil. This was a construction which combined a new framework for winding coils, an advanced Abha coil design, and a classic rodent coil pattern laying above it. The resulting unit could create a 20-foot magnetic field while stepping up energy in, a new and, in, in new and exciting ways. It used a total of 578 wires and took a, quite, took a quite a long time to construct. I stood there 18 hours sanding and soldering this coil in particular because of the 578 wires. 
and it took two months to complete. With it, we learned that the concentration of energy isn't in the core of the vortex coil structure. Rather, it is focused into the center hole of the torus. This observation was made after our embedded plasma ring did not activate in the way we had imagined. So I'm not sure if, if you guys could make this out, but right in the center there, there's like a uh, reflection. That's an actual plasma ring. It was blown by Bill Chebb, who does the Hold the Clock Rife Technologies. And uh, we expected that we were going to create a type of plasma reactor, a desktop plasma reactor that would rotate plasma around. Didn't happen. Inside the cavity of the vortex is a null zone, so we could almost imagine creating our housing structures and living in there, and that would be a safe place to live, where all the magnetic energy is compressed into the very center versus the way that we're doing now with our regular type of wiring, where we're just literally inside of boxes of electricity that protrude outwards, they interact with our energies, they disrupt our fields and such. So this would allow for a different way of uh, creating housing structures and pretty much everything, but we'll continue on there. The POE coil. In order to add position and ease to the coil winding experience, we developed a new slotted disc frame which acts as the support for the vortex coil conductors. When combined with a simple spiraling POE pattern, coil construction can now be a quick, accurate, and enjoyable process. This approach is more cost effective and less time consuming than most 3D printer options available today for detailed frame construction and mass manufacturing. So our overall approach was to create something that could be replicatable every single time with precision. And uh, right now there are other people working on very, very elaborate coil designs using 3D printing machines and basically creating solid structures with grooves in them. We found that this approach was more practical. It can piece together very rapidly. It's very cost effective, um, you know, under $100 per frame. So it's, it's very amazing that you could just piece together something very, very quickly and you have 100% symmetry every time. So that's where we came up with the frame and the, the wiring algorithm. We, we think that, it, you know, it's essentially most important to uphold the integrity of the vortex just use that vortex energy as a fundamental. It doesn't really matter where the conductors are ending, where they're starting. It's really just about creating that shape and utilizing that shape and the fundamental of vortex energy. So this is the general method of excitation. So in our standard configuration for electrically testing a vortex coil, channel A and channel B are powered in reverse direction via stereo amplifiers. So we didn't have a chance to set this up yet, but we can talk you through it. Once the resonant frequency is reached, the vortex coil generates a high voltage oscillation, which is perfect for lighting and battery charging. In most cases, the measurements indicate an ability to maintain current while amplifying voltage by at least a factor of 10. So what we see is we have 30 volts going into the coil. We have 130 volts coming out of the coil. Now, what's happening to the amperage is the question, because a lot of these Tesla tech technologies they step up voltage, but at the expense of current. You have no current. You, you have high voltage, but no current. There's no, no power there. So what this is doing is it's, comp it's compensating maybe 10 milliamps of current, no more. So what we're seeing is at least a, double, a doubling of how much energy is coming out of the coil versus what's going into it, which is groundbreaking news. And it allows us to engineer devices on this principle instead of looking at it from the sense of let's give energy here and extract energy here and lose all of that inductive coupling and we waste power. Instead, we're resonating our load with the coil and we're getting into this understanding of resonance and how much we can actually affect technologies as a result. Some of those testing observations? Testing ob observations. Controllable low voltage ozone production, multiple magnetic monopole detection, energy gains using a one-to-one -one ratio, one-to-one -one ratio coils, coil sensitivity to the Earth's magnetic field, bioelectric interactions with the coil, energy reduction when charging batteries or spinning magnets, synchronization of multiple rotors at different axes, plasma excitation through the center of a vortex coil, increased growth rates in plants around coils, self-cooling properties when running high voltage, very large magnetic fields for little input power, 576 LEDs illuminated using only one watt of power, and many more. 
So this is huge. <laughs> this is very important stuff. <laughs> Bioelectric interactions with the coils. What does that mean? That means that we could literally replace the sound frequency generator with our own bioelectric energy. You can, any one of you, you don't have to have special powers. You can come over, grab the input source with your own bioelectric energy, and your bioelectric energy will trigger a response in this coil to generate high voltage and over unity. Yeah, no. <laughs> oh, no. That's amazing. So that's, that's just one of those things. And plasma reactors, main problem with the plasma reactors, they have to turn off in two minutes. What if we can run our plasma reactors indefinitely without ever overheating? It's a big deal. Maximum ozone detection. This is the unification coil rewired. With it, we tested the strength of ozone produced by the vortex coil resonance. On a scale from one to four, each result indicated the maximum concentration of O3. Now this one is uh, the new rewired unification coil, our frames. This is when we changed our frames for the second time. And if, from the research we've done, ozone is made from seven to 30,000 voltages, and we are getting ozone at a set frequency coming out of the center of this coil. Maybe 40 volts. <laughs> In most cases, O3 is used as a sterilizing agent for water, foods, and high traffic spaces, which are prone to contamination. We use it ourselves in our home. We'll turn on the coil, clear out the air of the room, and then come back in 30 minutes and scent free and perfect. <laughs> It'll literally take out any toxins. This is huge for third world countries that are suffering with diseases and all these different things, these different contaminations, and with no way to actually sterilize their, their spaces. Another method is using ultraviolet light, but that also consumes a lot of wattage. So what if we were able to create ozone generators using maybe 30 watts of power. What does that mean for sterilizing food, sterilizing water? So, so many different things. Not only will this coil structure the water, but it will also sterilize it if, you, if integrated with ozone. So that's a, a very huge application there. This is another big one. Agricultural applications. So this was our first experiment of wheatgrass being grown under low wattage LED crop lighting. We placed the oscillating coil next to the wheatgrass and found that the growth rates were accelerated in the sprouts closest to the vortex coil. In this way, we can boost plant growth via lighting and magnetic field influence, a low-cost solution for agricultural advancement. As you can see here, it's not, not that, really. not really. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me describe exactly what we, the, the testing resulted for us. Over here, th this small wheat grass was about light, it was light green and f very weak. And this one was a hunted green uh, color and it was just like strong and, and it grew a lot more. And it, the coil is right here on this side. So n the coil is powering the lights and is throwing out a huge electromagnetic field. So what we ended up seeing was a linear slope in, in, the, in, in the wheat grass. So it actually grew like this. So the coil was sitting right there and the wheat grass grows like this. So indicating that the magnetic influence is actually doing something to the plants and we're actually replicating this uh, back home right now with uh, cilantro. But I'm sure it could be applied to any different type of agriculture purpose. Did you say it was growing at an angle? It grew literally at an angle, what, what, yes. At what degree I couldn't see? It was, it was a linear slope like this, so that whatever... So normally it's that way and it was like that way? Yeah, so exactly. each... Oh, wow. all the, so it was like the growth rate was enhanced, and it literally tapered down as the magnetic field tapered down. So it just shows that's, just, that's the same thing we can do right here with this meter. We can show that when this coil is on, and actually this one's driving, so we could see that we're at max potential, and as we go away, our magnetic field is tapering down. So this actually, the last slide indicated the same exact thing, which was the linear slope. So the wheat grass that was closest, it grew faster. Vortex <laughs> coil lighting inverter, 11 LEDs, 1,300 lumens for only three fourths of a watt, 0.75. Here's our four-year-old Daniel Anthony doing his schoolwork using 0.75 watts of power. This unit utilizes a modified jewel thief circuit in conjunction with a PoE mini vortex coil in order to provide maximum intensity for less than one watt of input power. 
This type of light is perfect for off-grid villages, camping trips, or even as a ultra, uh, or even as an ultra-efficient nightlight. For me, yes, my nightlight. <laughs> finally. <laughs> so the nightlight that was. This is this is where it all started, and we don't see it finishing here. <laughs> But this is where it all began, and when we finally got that accomplished, this is three fourths of a watt, putting out a thousand three hundred plus lumens. And what's it normally? What it would be normally is maybe around the same consumption, but a lot less intensity. So Phillips, we're we're getting much more intensity. Philips currently has uh, two hundred lumens for one watt of power. So we have 0.75 for thousand three hundred. Yeah, you had said that uh, obviously if we just touch it, we can power the coil ourselves. We are by own. Amplified with yeah. an amplifier, of course, yes. Now, could you theoretically with plants, did you see that presentation done where the plants were actually singing? Like they were making the music, it was over there. Uh, so you could touch the little stands over there. Somebody had the plants connected to something and they were mm. actually playing the music. So my question was, is could you theoretically connect the plants to the coil as well? And they would amplify that too. We did yes. that with a tree. Yes. With, uh, <laughs> what was it? A peach tree. Yes. Well, what you're talking about with the peach tree, we had a peach tree We resonated the whole cavity of the tree in, in order to move to the far reaches of the tree, to the extremities, and listen to actual tones that were playing through the entire tree using minimal wattage. But yes, you can, you can basically take the plug, plug it into the ground, so right to the earth, and amplify earth energy through the amplifier in order to stimulate the same response, yes. Any, bio, any, any bioelectric energy will do. So that's, thank you. So this is uh, conserve power while producing power. This, is, this has got to be one of the most low-hanging fruits that are available right now. This is the experiment we utilize with, in, with a 14 gauge POE coil, can handle one kilowatt of power for the purpose of energy conservation. By feeding energy through the coil in opposing directions, we attain a 10 to 15% savings of total power consumption with a minor temperature drop of 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Then, using the focused magnetic, magnetic potential, we spun a magnetic shaft above it, essentially illuminating 192 LEDs with the pickup energy that was being generated by the spinning magnetic energy. What does that mean? That means that we can feed energy through this coil using the energy that we're already using right now in this room. Just feed the energy through the coil and now you can have a generator that runs off of the energy that we're already using. So why not maximize the energy that we're already consuming in a very simple way. So this, this is not just one coil we're talking about. We can build generators around the energy that we're already consuming. It's all pulsing at 60 hertz. Why not generate more with what we're already consuming? So that's the concept here. So 10 degrees Fahrenheit, for those of you who, who are not aware, it's not very much of a drop at all in temperature. So 10 to 15% savings, you save on your power bill, produce more power. Vortex coil plasma excitation. This was an experiment using the POE coil to excite our previous plasma tube using the electromagnetic compression of the center hole. At under 50 volts of input power, we are able to yield enough output voltage to power a 400 volt xenon tube while providing charge to the central plasma ring in the process. This concept can be scaled for electrode-less lamp technologies or advanced plasma reactor designs which maintain a cool temperature instead of overheating. So this was it was heartbreaking at first to take apart that coil that took us two months to construct. So we actually had to take out that plasma tube. You see it right through the center now. How do we know that that would work? Well, we took a fluorescent tube while we were driving the vortex coil at, at its most resonant point, and we put it right in the center. And you could see that the gas was wanting to excite just around the inner diameter. So then we figure, okay, well, if the gas is wanting to excite on its own, then why not just take out that old plasma tube and wind the coil around just so that it's two rings intertwined? It makes perfect sense. And if this were to be scaled up, it touches right back on what we were saying before. Plasma is used for healing. It's used for power production. It's used for a host of different things. And a lot of people are making great breakthroughs right now with plasma. So why not use coils that cool themselves down? So resonance, again, resonance. 
One to 7.6 step up, step down Tesla Vortex Transformer. This is our combination of Tesla's alternating transformer ratios with Vortex Energy Fundamentals. In this way, we are able to generate high voltage using much lower frequencies than ever before. This system can be applied to a number of applications and aims to introduce ways of combining new concepts with much older ones. So we're working off of this idea that the coils are able to create this resonant spike or this resonant energy by feeding energy in opposite directions. So now what happens when you take the same concepts that Tesla was presenting using the fine gauge wire and then the thick wire at the bottom to, ex to create that different, uh, that different ratio. So when you do that, you find that this coil is able to put out even higher voltage. So it's able to work off of that same resonance but amplify it even more. So that could be used for lighting purposes. We could be pulsing our lights or charging our batteries while we're using our electricity. It just gives a different option for how you can apply this, this fundamental. And we're stuck there. There we go. <laughs> Some early applications. Low wattage lighting inverters, magnetic pulse therapy devices for plants and animals, 3D sound speakers, solid state battery chargers, energy efficient wireless induction mats, low power induction heaters, efficient motor generator designs, low power induction lamp technologies, advanced step up step down transformers using one to one coils. So all these things are really, really viable solutions right now for how we can integrate these coils and there are many more that we didn't even touch on. HHO is one. We had a gentleman replicate our coil and he actually applied it for low voltage HHO. He was using one watt of power and he was able to create or separate the hydrogen from the water in order to use it as a fuel cell. So that's something that's possible. So magnetic pulse therapy. We're creating expansive magnetic fields. This is not something I wouldn't suggest right now for people to be pulsing themselves with coils because it has not been peer reviewed yet. But we already know that PEMF therapies exist. They use regular coil designs and it's just basically the same thing, copper wound in a regular way. And now what we want to do is change the way that we're winding that copper. We want to use the vortex fundamentals presented in VBM and we want to use that to our advantage, create a bigger magnetic field that consumes less energy. Why not? Why not have a coil that can pulse right here in, in the center of the room and everybody can experience that pulse electromagnetic therapy using low wattage. So that's possible. 3D sound, what does that mean? Well, if we were to turn on this coil and play, play music through it, we can literally perceive the sound in a different way. It sounds like it's coming from different corners of the room almost. And when you play tones, it's, it's quite magical. You can hear different things coming from different places. You think you're going crazy. Without but surround sound. <laughs> but it's no surround sound. It's just one coil, one magnet put on top of it. You can amplify it with aluminum but it's very basic and that coil can produce a very, very unique type of sound. So that's 3D sound, solid state battery charging. This is the same thing that we talked about. This is the same thing that we're seeing here. Instead of running these lights, we could be charging our batteries, serve as uh, backup systems that can run off of small solar panels. You're out and about, your car stalls out, you need 12 volts, you don't have anywhere to get it. Well, now you can carry around with something like that in your car and Saves, saves Talking a lot from of personal <laughs> experience. <laughs> it actually worked. <laughs> so um, wireless, wireless induction mats, it's another thing. Wireless induction mats consume a lot of power right now, but that's also because of the old design. We're, we're again talking about this old circulating, just one layering above the next. That is not the way energy wants to flow. And we will have deeper insights later on today by Mr. Randy Powell, and he'll talk a little bit more on why that's like that because all energy wants to flow in the natural way and that's a different type of circulating pattern. So low energy induction mats, it's possible. So we'll just move right along there. After many dedicated hours designing, building, and testing various coils, vortex coils, excuse me, we have come to the conclusion that it is possible to engineer a whole new line of technologies around the novel fundamentals presented here. Now, our goal is to incorporate these designs into introductory applications in order to generate the support necessary for further R&D. 
As support grows, we also see these technologies advancing very rapidly, allowing for a tremendous impact in a number of sectors. Example, battery charging, battery storage, industrial lighting, industrial agriculture, and many others. On a fundamental level, this testing has demonstrated a profound relationship between precision engineering, sound frequency, magnetism, electricity, and most importantly, resonance. So this is where we're all unifying our, all of our understandings, each one of us that are here today and that are at home researching this, this different type of field. We're all talking about the same exact thing, sound frequency, what that does with resonance, how to get things interacting in a resonant way in order to make the most efficiency of our energy, in order to heal ourselves, in order to heal our environment, in order to create energy in a different way that's not detrimental to our planet. So we do feel that this is a very low hanging fruit that would allow people to experiment with this. This is very basic fundamentals. We've also given out all of the information online. We have over 100 videos supporting this work and showing how to apply it, how to build it, how to test it and everything. So this is something that we want to have other people working on in order to further and broaden the understanding because you know, we don't claim to have all the answers, but we know that if we give out the information, then other engineers can come together and say, hey, listen, well, there was something very, very fundamental that you overlooked, and this is how you can apply it. So that's very crucial to our development. And uh, that's basically our presentation. We wanted to open up for questions right now. Yeah. <laughs> We haven't done it. We haven't. We have the question. The question was, how is it that aluminum is able to amplify the sound frequency quality? Uh, I'm just curious because aluminum is paramagnetic uh, and it's a conductor at the same time. So if you have, you know, iron or um, a magnet to make a regular speaker, if you also had a paramagnetic to act as a faster switch for the magnetic field. I'm just curious if that's why it's making it sound better if you do do that experiment. To my understanding, aluminum conducts electricity in the opposite way from the copper, so that when we bring the aluminum close to the copper, what happens is it amplifies because there's friction against the copper, the energy that's coming off of the copper, and what's going through the aluminum. So when you place the magnet next to it, so just sitting it on top, it doesn't have to be internal. I think we suspect that when you use it internally it will disrupt some of the resonance because again the electricity wants to flow in the opposite direction from the aluminum so when you put it right on top you're able to amplify sound in, in a unique way next question the, the question is what is the website the website is the number one the character one stop stop energies ies dot com yeah. That's, uh, the website is onestopenergies.com. Uh, I missed the beginning, but what was the, what was the manufacturing? Oh, yes. <laughs> um, I was asking, um, what are the, the, how are you manufacturing? Are they, are they being made by hand? Do you have some sort of a, a jig or something that you're using to build this? Or you through, you, you, I, I missed the first few minutes, so. I know how you did that. Well, what we're doing right now is we, we're having these little discs made, made by a uh, laser machine, so laser cutting machine. So what they do is they basically insert a big slab of a certain material, cut out a series of spoked discs, and it slides onto a central frame that basically holds all those discs in place. After that, we're taking this wire, stretching it out, let's say, for this small one, 20 feet, for the bigger one, 50 feet. And we're basically just taking a multi-filler approach of wires, twisting them all together in order to distribute electricity or the, the tension amongst all those wires. It's a Litz wire effect. So we're stretching out, twisting it, and winding it first counterclockwise and clockwise. And Erica actually did a very detailed video on that, and we have it available. In the beginning, we used a regular Dremel tool and plexiglass. And that's why it took us about two months to construct because everything was done by hand. 
Yes, in the beginning everything was handcrafted. It took a very long time, and now we're figuring out ways to speed along that process. How long and it took now? From two months to what? Two months to five hours. Nice. <laughs> so, it's, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Two, two months to five hours. Big difference. <laughs> I was absolutely sure she was using a mix master to twist this together. <laughs> yes, it, portable electric drill works wonders. Absolutely. So what, what gauge wire do you use? On, do you use different gauge for different coils? Yes. We, we definitely do use different gauges for different coils. You see here, this is a 28 gauge coil. And um, it's all different spacing. How, how many conductors you want to have in that coil? For what purpose, what application? Are you using it as a pickup coil? Are you using it to create the resonance? Are you using it for energy reduction purposes? Energy reduction would need 14 gauge wire, much heavier build, so they can handle more current. What about HHO? HHO, that has been used with 24 gauge wire before. Okay. So typically it's, it's 24, yes. Hello, hi, uh, a few months back, an independent researcher online uh, posted a video about um, on a PoE coil that he took the individual wires and placed them in series, so it was one wire. And he said that, uh, that as he was smoking in his laboratory, he witnessed that the smoke, uh, yeah, was compressed and accelerated through the center. And so uh, that really um, ignited a lot of inspiration and, and reminded me of a lot of uh, Dr. Eugene Pakhanov uh, experiments where he had a rotating superconductor created a pressure differential. And I'm wondering if you had any experiences like that, where there was reduced mass, where there was um, uh, accelerated mass at the center of the coil um, for propulsion means, for instance. I'm just wondering your thoughts and experience. Levitation. Yes, levitation is something that we've also demonstrated. It's a type of uh, maximum compression into the very center of the vortex. So rolling coils also exhibited that same property. Any coil that we, well, I, I believe personally that any coil that is truly a vortex coil should have that same type of levitation effect. But touching on what you were just saying there, if you put an incense underneath the coil, you can actually see that the incense does accelerate into a different type of spiral right, right up the middle of the coil. What does that mean? I, I mean, magnetism is affecting everything. We also know that these coils are producing ozone so if we're able to separate the oxygen molecules in order for it to bind to a, com a, a united pair to create O3, then we know that it has the ability to interact with actual molecules. So it should be interacting with everything. If you submerge it into water, it will actually split the, ox the, the uh, hydrogen and you could see the bubbles coming up. So it should work with uh, a number of different things. We haven't tried everything, but... The standard PoE coil does use a series connection for the two conductors. It, it essentially uses a multi-filler approach, twisted together, and at the end what we're doing is we're creating a series looping effect. So that essentially it's multiple progressions in through the center of the vortex. The more progressions that we do, the more magnetic energy we're able to collect and we're getting a bigger resonance as we increase those conductors. So at some point we will experiment with 144 conductors and we will exhibit a lot more resonance yielding bigger voltage spikes, and et cetera. Hi, uh, my question is about the magnetic field. I'm really curious, have you guys mapped it out? Where's the north, where's the south? Is it in motion? Do you have, you were mentioning you had some type of monopole. How do you, or something like that, I want, as much detail as you get in the short time we have, just a little bit to give me, I'm just curious as hell. So I just want to know <laughs> Certainly. The, the magnetic fields, is it rotating? Is it this, where it is, is it moving, you know? And is there any monopole type things? So we actually have these, <laughs> these little, he's actually got the device right there that we use. So it's a pole detector, a magnetic pole detector. So maybe we could just grab this really quickly. Thank you. This is actually the same device that we use it's a magnetic pole detector, so what we're doing with this is driving the coils with alternating current, 
and we can take this little pole detector as you can see it gives a little ind indication of whether north or south so right now this is south and that's north so we can do the same thing with the coil we're creating an electromagnet essentially and you bring this right into the middle and we have a south then you say okay where's the north let's flip it over south so alternating current will provide south on both sides when we apply it with DC, we could just take the coil in its same state, connect it right to a DC source, and what we're going to get is south, and then a void. So it's like the DC is creating nothing more than just a south. Now what happens when we take it south of the equator? What happens? Does it turn into a north? We would love to see somebody <laughs> replicate south of the equator and figure this out where is the north and how do we access it we don't know where the north is but it's a pulsed field it's not a but in the dc it's a static field but it's only south with no north at all south and a void do you rewind it so that it's a north with a void only south we've never seen a north only never that's what i'm asking never if you reverse the polarity, what happens? The void becomes on this side, and the south is on the other. I have a question. One-way directional thrust, yes. My question is, uh, have you tried several coils as in a step-up transformer to keep increasing the voltage? Yes. What happens is, is that when you're feeding the output from one coil into the next coil, it will destroy the next coil because the resonance is so intense that it will just literally, what happens, there's so much ozone production. And what we're actually seeing is that the inner diameter of the coil becomes saturated with this type of film or this white type of powder that just condenses all the electrons right into the center. So you see there's something physical that's actually happening there. And it's, it's quite amazing. Did you say white powder? A white type of powderish type of residue that forms, and you can scrape it off. And it's, it's pretty in interesting. We haven't tested it. What happens when we test it? I would love to see that as well. That's right. If you give me the details, I'll test mine. Because as far as I know, is there another one of your poles in the southern hemisphere other than the one I've got? That's it. Okay, good. <laughs> no, nobody else other than Michael Tellinger has a vortex coil in the South southern Africa. hemisphere. <laughs> yeah. Hello. You haven't done that test, though, to see if it's south only. Okay, good. Well, let's swap numbers. It's really important with something I'm working on, so I'm curious. <laughs> Hello. Um, I was wondering if you plan to have any schools or workshops on how to build these coils? Well, actually, we, we just got word that um, there may be a school opening up for vortex-based mathematics within the near future. So we would love to have some of these fundamentals taught there as well and uh, just share what it is that we found in implementing this technology. So yes, uh, we would love to create more detailed instructional videos. We do have all those testings online available right now for viewing but we would like to gear it towards a more professional uh, educational system as well. Hello, yes. um, I really enjoyed the polarity question. I, mean, I think that's a real key uh, to understanding this, if we could figure it out. But my question was, when I first saw the rodent coil, I thought, this is it. This is the key to the emitterless light. And you guys have been demonstrating it with sound frequencies, and I just wondered, has anybody tried like a terahertz frequency generator and maybe stacking these together and getting like a opposing forces to essentially energize light directly from the ethers in this space? This is what I wanted to see. That is, that is a huge, huge question. Thank you for that. And you know what? We, we have been limited by our technology. We're not capable of driving anything in the terahertz range because this device caps out in the megahertz range. The amplifier caps out in the high uh, kilohertz range, so we, we've never been able to get up to that range, but I'm sure that we will see some type of interaction at higher frequencies. It's, everything is frequency, and the more you find different resonances with different objects or crystals maybe, you know, it's, it could be very interesting. <laughs> I have a question with regard to the uh, north-south issue. There you go. <laughs> the, um, I'm kind of new to this, and uh, Whenever it's been, whenever people have talked north and south for me forever, it's like, 
okay, they call it north and south, but isn't it going in one side and out the other side? And this guy this morning that was talking said that north-south is absolutely the wrong way to think about it. You gotta think about it as inflow and outflow. Mm. And if you think about that, I know nothing about what you're doing, and I'm gonna find out more, but um, that would explain why you could have a north and a void, or a south and a void, because it's flowing out, and it's, and it's not doing the inside or the out. But I don't know which, is north in or north out? I mean, <laughs> that is the question. Inflow or outflow? I mean. South I do. is usually out, north is usually in. So okay. the poles of the Earth's magnetic field come out of the southern hemisphere, they go around and then come in. Basically, it's this simple. The, um, the field comes out of the south, south, southern hemisphere, goes around, and then comes in in the northern hemisphere. So that's, that's how right. it works. So now, what, what's what's now? Now, what he's saying is, you know, ultimately. So, what is this doing then? So, is it, is it creating an out, nothing but out? Or what we have seen is that putting a rod through the center. That's the only time we can actually focus enough magnetic energy into the metal to see the North Pole. So that's the only time that we've ever detected a North Pole. Never a North by itself. It's all, if you introduce a metal element, then you can detect. Hi, John again. Um, question I had was, um, I don't under, I mean, I understand how the coils are constructed, but I've seen people use you know, electricity, put electricity into them, in the DC or AC, but then I've heard people say, you know, you put it in a certain frequency. I don't, how do you do the frequency part? What device or equipment do you use to do both power and adjust frequency? The frequency impulse that we're talking about, it's not acoustical sound. And we had that question earlier. Uh, if we ever exhibited any kind of effect using acoustical sound, we tried it, maybe just putting the coil above a speaker and trying to see what happened electrically, nothing. But what we're using is an electrical impulse, which is a frequency frequency impulse. So we're creating a sound frequency with this device or any other device. You can use an Android phone, iPhone, computer, or what have you. We're amplifying that sound frequency with an amplifier. And after that, we're feeding it through the coil. Okay. Thank you. Sounds, excuse me, sounds to me like you're getting uh, a south pole only, and you're getting a white precipitate, which sounds like it might be warmest, maybe you're generating a singularity. That is the same thing that I was thinking before, but we haven't tested it to know for sure, but that would be interesting. The white powder, I'm not sure why it condenses only to the very center, and I would suspect that it has to be something like that. It's doing something elemental, and um, just, the, just the fact that it condenses is a big deal, because otherwise, if it were you know, any kind of byproduct of ozone in any other sense, it would be everywhere along the coil, not just on the inner diameter. So it has to be something relating to something that's happening molecularly with, you know, I, I don't know, but that's and something not, that we definitely have time, to test. Because only at a set frequency. Because we pulse with the coils personally at uh, certain frequencies for our chakras. We pulse with the coils, so not if we're pulsing at 432 hertz, we don't get the residue from the ozone production. Kilohertz? In the kilohertz range, so it's particular to each coil design, this coil would resonate somewhere around 20 to 30 kilohertz, whereas the bigger ones would be a slightly lower resonant frequency. So once we're getting the coils into that resonance and not pulsing it like a closed loop system, but allowing the electricity to flow and escape, there's a self-cooling that happens with the coils, and then it also creates that, that high voltage resonance. Yeah. With regards to synergizing your coils with LED grow lights, what are some of the performance increases you have measured and come to expect? So that's, that's again, we can drive large panels of LEDs using a few watts of power and uh, we've used uh, red and blue LEDs, we've used white LEDs, we've used, you know, but in more particular, red and blue LEDs is what you would use for agriculture. The blue activates the seeds, the red activ it activates blossoming. So you're using red and blue, purple light, and you're also using the magnetic potential to enhance the, the growth of whatever it is that you're growing. You can sit it right up on top of the coil and drive the lights sitting above that or, you know, it could be a number of different configurations, but that's basically how it's done. Red and blue. 
Um, actually, can I get that? Uh, um, hold back your back. I, I have a question regarding um, the, the whole thing we're talking about, like, magnetic um, polarization. Um, yeah, please. So um, I'm curious uh, if you can see. I have uh, two norts over here, and uh, can you that? I don't need this right here. So I have uh, both norts on this side of the uh, just iron ferrite. It's about 400 permeability. And on the other side, uh, it should be, uh, take these off side, so that's too fast. <laughs> so we have um, all south on this end and all north on this end, very similar to some Floyd Sweet or other concepts. What I'm trying to, um, curious about is if it's all north, uh, it's magnetized all north in this polarity, and on the other end, the south is not fully uh, magnetized, showing that the south doesn't fully magnetize mm. this iron bar, which is the same probability as the other iron bar, as well as um, yeah, it's, it's fully uh, magnetized on the north. And when I, uh, what? That's intense. <laughs> yeah, so, I, <laughs> so with that then, uh, I'm also curious if you go down to the southern hemisphere, if that's going to switch. That and then the other thing is, is if I uh, saturate the ends of them, uh, depending on different alignments, I can actually get a, uh, you know how if you take a, uh, one of these units, you put it directly at the block, the blocked wall, you can get it to uh, slightly oscillate, which I'm not able to do right now, of course. Uh, I've been very curious, uh, I've been able to move the blocked wall, it looks like, in these magnets just through straight um, uh, permanent magnet saturation, static fields. So I'm just curious what, what is happening with that, and why is it that there's you know, complete north saturation uh, over not complete south saturation. I am actually please. not sure, <laughs> to be honest with you. I do not know. That's the first time I've seen that. So uh, I wouldn't be able to answer that question if anyone else in the room is able to answer that question. I'm not sure. On your That's very interesting. Very interesting. We're gonna have your blotch wall into will change with magnets. If you take two magnets and put them north, south, north, south, and move them apart, your blotch wall will go from one magnet to the other. And I don't know if it has to do with magnetic strength. It would be one smidgen stronger on one side than the other, but you can pull them back together. The other thing you can do with blotch walls that I've done is stack many, many magnets, and it always goes to the center. Mm. If the magnets are basically the same strength, your blotch wall, so you got one, one magnet that's north-south, like a nickel. The heads is north and the south is... is <laughs> Pardon me, Sal. And you stack them together, the blotch wall always stays in the middle. And this is why we're here for breakthrough energy. When one person doesn't have the answer, there will be someone else with the answer. Um, I'm going to have to take that, that over. We should definitely talk more after this, all. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. I'm just. Um, <laughs> Send me <yeah>. one. <laughs> Here, show them where we the have many questions. Is. Right here, uh, this is north, south, north, south, makes middle one in the middle here. Yeah, if I take another magnet and put it in between here, the watch wall will now move to here. You show them. Yeah. Okay. And then, um, uh, totally. Yeah, right. <laughs> so the back up. There are better units to test magnetic field alignment. I've done it very, very, comp very competently, and the blotch wall always goes to the middle. It seems like yes. No, it always does. What I'm, I'm curious with is I've got uh, similar things where um, if this thing uh, I've, last Tesla tech, someone made a monopole um, demonstration with the rodent coil, and using this exact same unit. It uh, did the same pulsing as a blotch wall that was happening. It was the same thing. It was a whole um, just north yes. uh, coil. And we also and ex we experienced that same pulsing before. So if we were to put the coil at a specific frequency, it could be pulsing at, let's say, 144. But we will experience a different type of pulsing effect as if the magnetic energy is pulsing at 4 hertz for whatever reason as an undertone. I have no idea why that happens. This has done that as well, so I'm yeah. curious, you know, combining yeah. static and dynamic energies. 
Did you uh, uh, did you measure the magnetic field like around the coil? Yes. Like I think if you measure it and if you measure the intensity and direction, you can plot out the magnetic field, the field lines. So definitely, we actually when the coils are in resonance, we can walk away from the unit with this little device. It's called a tri-field meter, and we can detect that when that coil is in maximum resonance, we can move 20 feet away from the coil and still be able to detect the strong magnetic energy. So. It would, it would be wonderful to see uh, full color imaging or different type of high tech imaging to actually see the energy that's coming out of it. A better visual is definitely needed for, in the future, so that's something that we, we look forward to accomplishing. You may be able to use a ferrofluid system to, 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 to demonstrate that. Fer, ferrofluid has no effect in the middle. We did try it. Yeah, there's, there's no response in ferrofluid. A little bit. We haven't we haven't tried it on the no, television magnetic screen. Magnetic yeah. paper. The mag, you know the magnetic paper that you can see. It, it forms a spiral actually. <laughs> you can yeah we've taken I pictures of that. I'd love to see that photo. Yes, definitely. Okay, it seems that time is up, but we will have a table outside where we will have the time to connect it and everybody can come and experience uh, the magnetic fields and see the lighting inverters for themselves. Okay. Thank you everyone. Thank you so very much. much. Thank you.